Why do I have to build an SET amp with Type 45 tubes? Hello, welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. Let's talk about a very special SET amp. I have a Facebook friend who's a friend of an old friend who can fix anything and did keep my dad's system going for many years. And this Facebook friend builds tube amps specifically single-ended triode amps. Since I built my first single-ended pentode amp, he has been encouraging me in various ways and trying to clue me in. What are the best practices for high-quality, high-value builds? What are the highest quality, highest value amps to build? What are the best output transformers and where do I find them? The first amplifier design that he suggested was the Simple 45. Today I want to talk about that design and why I have to build it. So let's talk about single-ended triode or SET amps, the triodes used in SET amps, directly heated triodes, type 45 triodes, the simple 45 or tube lab SE design, and why I have to build it. I'll start with the last. I have to build the Simple 45 to justify two amazing gifts from relative strangers. The first gift was this chassis. It's handmade of aluminum and wood by a local farmer. I note that he's a farmer in part to explain the fact that he has a shop with tools capable of making this thing and the skills to pull it off. In my limited experience, farmers are smart, hyper-competent, and rational like no other group of modern Americans, and I include ranchers in that group. The man who gave me this chassis came to me as a total stranger and treated me like a friend. He saw one or more of my amplifiers listed on Craigslist and checked out my YouTube channel. Here's the email he sent. About 10 years ago, I was building custom blank chassis and selling them on eBay. Anyway, life got busy and I stopped building them as it was my third job at the time. HP, farming, and chassis fabrication. Anyways... Recently, I was cleaning up the farm shops and rescuing audio gear, and I came across an unfinished chassis, 10 inches by 10 inches by 2 inches. The chassis needs a bottom plate, which I could either find or build. My question for you is, could you use this chassis? If so, I would be happy to put the bottom plate on it, and it's yours. The only thing I would ask in return is if I ever have a technical question as I rebuild or repair my old equipment, that you could be available to answer my questions via email, or... If this is something you are not interested in, I would understand, and we'll toss it in the to-keep pile. He came to my house, we chatted about this and that, and he left me with this chassis and a pair of output transformers. I haven't tested the transformers, but they're probably appropriate for a DGSE-1, but also don't appear to be anything too special. The chassis is special but it's not very big. It might support a preamp or maybe a small power amp sporting modest iron. The second gift was a pair of these Tamura output transformers. A local tube enthusiast saw one or more of my amplifiers on Facebook Marketplace and messaged me to say that he had some output transformers I might be interested in. That tube enthusiast was Niels Nielsen, Gonzo engineer and host slash leader of the Corvallis Tube Collective. I had heard of Niels and the Collective. Niels had even given his card to my son when he worked at a local thrift store. Me being me, I hadn't followed up on the contact. When Niels reached out, again, I asked about meeting up, and he invited me to the next meeting of the Collective. At the meeting, he brought out the Transformers and told me their story. A late member of the collective had ordered them new from Japan in 1999, but never got around to using them. When he passed on, Niels and the collective inherited the Transformers. Niels told me, here's the deal. You get them for half of what they're selling for on eBay. The thing is, they don't often come up for sale, so I couldn't immediately figure out how much I'd need to pay. Plus, I didn't immediately know what to do with them. I left that meeting empty-handed. That meeting was just before Christmas. What with the holidays and an ice storm that shut down the city, the collective didn't meet again for about a month, and I had put the Transformers on my mental list of items to think about buying. 
At the next meeting, to which I brought some show and tell and a nice bottle of Laphroaig single malt scotch, Neil said, I offered you the Transformers for half price and you didn't take them. The rule is that now you get them for free and all you have to do is run off clutching them and chortling with glee. I agreed to these terms and went home with the Transformers, my show and tell items, and what was left of the scotch. Long story short, Niels has been accumulating various items like these for years and is eager to offload them. My attendance of two meetings in a row makes me one of the collective and therefore somehow entitled to items acquired by the collective. I think. Still, I consider these Transformers to be an amazing gift, obligating me to use them in an amplifier worthy of them. So, why build a single-ended triode or SET amp? A previous video of mine goes into the question in some depth. The short answer for me is that I'm intrigued by SET amps and they are highly desirable. That is, if I do a good job building one, I should be able to make back my investment and more if I decide to sell the amp. I'll summarize my previous video with the following. SET amps generally have more harmonic distortion than any other kind of hi-fi power amp, whether tube or solid state. But the distortion is dominated by even order harmonics, which occur at octave intervals and are therefore pleasing to the ear. You could say that SET amps sound good for the same reason that 12-string guitars sound good. I'll add something else. SET amps, which generally don't have negative feedback, derive their sound primarily from the characteristics of the tubes they use, and arguably rely less on circuit design. What tubes are best for SET amps? Triad tubes, right? Yes, but... Some popular SET amps use pentodes. How are they SET amps then? Pentodes can be wired as triodes. Pentodes have a secondary or screen grid in addition to the primary grid. Actually, pentodes have three grids, but the third is always connected internally to the... If we connect the screen grid directly to the plate, then the pentode effectively becomes a triode. However, the most popular triodes for SET amps are actual triodes. Probably the most popular output tube for SET amps these days is the 300B, which can produce up to 8 watts of audio power. The 2A3, which can produce 2.5 to 4 watts, is somewhat popular. EL84 or 6BQ5 pentodes wired as triodes are also relatively popular in SET amps. If you want more power than a 300B can offer, you could wire two or more triodes in parallel, but that sort of design isn't really considered SET. So, if you need an SET amp with real power, you'll need to go with triodes originally designed for use in radio transmission. If you can manage a supply of 5,000 volts, an RS-329G transmitter triode can supposedly produce 500 watts. I found an amp online made by NAT Audio. It uses a big hunkin' QB5-1750 transmitter tube that can deliver 80 watts. They make those as monoblocks, of course, and sell them for 17,000 euros each so a pair would set you back 34,000 euros. Typically then, SET amps don't produce a lot of power. The 300B and 2A3, really most of the power triodes used in SET amps, are directly heated triode, or DHT, tubes. All the tubes I've ever used are indirectly heated. A heater filament runs at relatively low voltage and high current, and it heats the cathode to create the electron mist that is attracted by the anode or plate. The voltage on the grid acts like a gate, either promoting or inhibiting the movement of those electrons through the vacuum. Modest voltage fluctuations on the grid can thereby produce big fluctuations in the current and hence voltage at the plate. Thus, amplification. Directly heated triodes work the same, 
except that the heater is also the cathode. Does this mode of operation improve the sound? I don't know. Among directly heated triodes, the Type 45 tube seems to get some of the highest praise. If you can be satisfied with the relatively low power it can produce, the 45 might produce the sweetest sound. It's capable of 1.5 to 2 watts, so a little less than the 2A3. As it happens, the 45 tube and the Tamura transformers supplied by the collective are an ideal match in current and impedance. The transformers would also work well with EL84 pentode tubes, but I've built like 5 amps now with EL84s, and an EL84 wired as triode based SET amp would surely be nice, but a 45 based SET amp would really be something special. And the TubeLab SE circuit, based on the so called Simple 45, appears to be the superior design. And it's a design that really appeals to my sensibilities in that it uses solid state devices to solve the problems for which solid state solutions are the best. Let's check it out. At the heart of the circuit, we find two triodes, one for the input stage and the second, our lovely 45, for the output stage. Between the triodes, though, is something odd. It's a MOSFET. A what? If you're unfamiliar, it's an acronym that's short for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. FETs, more generally, are different from more typical BJTs, or Bipolar Junction Transistors, in that current flow in a FET, from drain to source, is controlled by the voltage at the gate, whereas current flow in a BJT, from collector to emitter, is controlled by the small current at the base. Since FETs draw effectively zero current at the gate, the input impedance seen by the output of the driver is huge. On the other side, FETs can have very low on resistance between drain and source, so the output impedance seen by the input of the output stage is very small. These features of high input impedance and low output impedance just can't be matched with tubes or interstage transformers, never mind at next to no cost. Tubes and iron are expensive. The MOSFETs are like a buck fifty each. Over here, above the first triode, we find a box labeled something something CCSIC, which stands for Constant Current Source Integrated Circuit. You can make a decent constant current source with tubes, but the solid state CCS is cheap easy and effective. Over in the power supply, we find some more solid state devices. Diode rectifier for the negative voltage bias supply, and a high current low voltage regulator to provide DC to heat the 45 tube. Opinions on AC versus DC for DHTs vary, but George Anderson, the designer of this circuit, backs up his choice of DC with both listening tests and data. Whereas neither AC nor DC resulted in any audible hum, he noticed that AC heating made the notes sound fuzzy. Spectral analysis revealed that AC produced sidebands on the dominant tone at plus and minus 60 Hz. These probably wouldn't be noticeable at high frequencies, but could definitely make low frequencies sound fuzzy. That is, 60 Hz is a small fraction of, say, 1 kHz, but a large fraction of, say, 160 Hz. Regulated DC it is, then. I love this approach. I love tubes, but solid-state circuits are easier and require less compromise. In this design, we get to use tubes for amplification and enjoy the tube sound, and use solid-state devices to solve problems and make the tubes work better. We're using solid-state to allow the tubes to operate under ideal conditions and produce the best sound they're capable of. Also, with the regulated DC for the 45 tubes, commonly available power transformers with high voltage, 6 volt, 
and 5 volt secondary windings will serve our purposes, and the regulator will buck the 6 volts down to 2.5 volts. Now the trick with some of these solid state devices is that they come and go. None of the specific devices, other than the diodes, used in the original design are currently available through regular, reputable suppliers, like Mauser and Digikey. George has, however, updated the bill of materials as recently as 2019. I've checked the 2019 parts, and they are still available in 2024. But maybe I should order those soon. And when it comes to ordering, the tubes won't come cheap, but they won't be ridiculously expensive either. This amp will take some time. Why? Shouldn't I just get it done ASAP? Well, I've got other things in the queue that take priority. First, I've got some work for paying customers. Their stuff needs to come first. I've also got a couple of pieces that I've put a lot of work into and need a bit more. Those are the Peiko SA40, which I've featured on this channel, and the Sansui 1000, which I haven't. Although I've recorded a bunch of video of my work on that receiver, that work seems to go on and on and doesn't make for a nice punchy video. Okay. Turn the volume down. Turn it off. Switch box. Play. Turn it on. Good morning, friends. Sounding wonderful. Anyway, I want to try modding the power supply of the Peiko to see whether I can improve the performance. The Sensui needs work on the tuner, maybe just alignment of the multiplexer. I hope. And then I have a few tube amp projects that are further along, or at least would start further along, than the Simple 45. Two projects, or three if you count dual monoblocks as two, are from another amazing gift. Another total stranger brought me two Dynaco Mark III's and a Heathkit AA40. Check this out, y'all. I just had this just gifted to me out of the blue. A guy locally saw an ad for the DGSE-1 that I've got on sale on Craigslist and just emailed me saying, I've got these three tube amps that belong to my family, and I think you should have them, free of charge. I'll bring them to you. And this morning he did. Fucking amazing, man. So this here is a Heathkit model AA40. I haven't put anything in the tube tester. This is, I just set it down on my bench. I mean, look at the size of these transformers. Oh, so here's the mono amp. He gave me two of these. It's a Dynaco. Let me see. Dyna Company. Dyna is great about just like not bothering to put model numbers on things. So I'm assuming this is a Mark III or Mark IV. I, you know, I, this is essentially an unboxing, right? I have not looked into this yet. It's got a couple of KT88s. Other than carrying it down into my basement, this is my first look at it. The Heath kit is in pretty good condition but the Dynacos are rough. They all need more tubes, and some of those won't be cheap. Hmm, if I could sell the amps I have up for sale, I could afford all of these projects easily. Ah well. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Subscribe to the channel. Subscriptions have been growing steadily, but it'd be nice to get a bump in those. So, how about it, y'all? Anyway. Have a great day, and I will talk to you soon.